Hi there. Um, let me start with a story. So basically, there's a meme going around the internet that says the space shuttle is based on the size of a horse's behind. And frankly, I started doing research, and it's actually true to a certain extent. Because what happened was, years ago when Rome and all the other people started building things and they started transporting things around the world, what happened was they were always using horse-drawn carts. And physically, the best way to make a horse-drawn cart had to do with how the roads were at the time, which was essentially made, you know, dirt roads that they had to travel over. And what happened was the most effective way to like use horsepower was to put two horses side to side and the two horses would essentially start walking and the cart behind them was built pretty much where the wheels were put in where the horses hooves would go. So the wheels follow the horses hooves and the reason for that was if you put them outside it made ruts in the road that were inconsistent that cars that sorry these carts would not be able to stay on the road because they'd be going in a rut, out of a rut, in a rut, out of a rut, and they would end up breaking. So what happened was from ancient Rome, chariots were essentially the same width as the major transportation of you know, goods and things like that because all the carts had to be the same where the, all the horses followed one after the other, all the carts had to follow after the horses and so on. And what happened was that sizing stayed the same throughout history. And at some point, like in the 1800s, when they started building railroads, what happened was they went to the people who made the most similar type of equipment, which were the people who made horse-drawn carts. And the people who made horse-drawn carts ended up making railroad cars. Now, obviously, you can make railroad cars wider, but still, it was on the same wheelbase, and you had to keep it pretty much in line, and then besides of the width being limited by the size of the wheelbase, it also was the height, because if you made the, the, the railroad cars too tall and something happened, it would kind of tip over. Likewise, if you made the cars too wide, if you put things too far to one side, it would tip over. So for the most part, throughout history, railroad cars are now based on the size of a horse's behind. And when you start thinking about how goods are moved throughout the world, what happens is a lot of goods are based on how you can transport them. And most goods around the world are based on the size of a railroad car so that they can be readily transferred. I mean, for example, if you ever see like big ships in the ocean that are transporting things, they have all these containers on top of these ships. And the containers have to be made to be put on railroad cars, and that's a major way that they're transported around Europe, around the United States, so everything is consistently based on that. Now, what happened was that when people started talking about the space shuttle and other types of things, the space shuttle components of that were transported by railroad car, so therefore they had to fit on the railroad cars, and therefore they were based on the size of a horse's behind. Now, when I start talking about this, where you have the most advanced technology being based on dimensions that were, you know, essentially established back, you know, before, you know, we started taking, before, like, in the B.C. years, I guess now it's C.E. years, I'm old, so I call them B.C. So anyway, like, you know, they're based on, like, year, like, uh, 500 B.C. Now, why is this important? Think about this. I don't know how many of you are responsible for budgeting your cybersecurity programs, but when you think about it, how are you budgeting for next year's cybersecurity program? You're budgeting for next year's cybersecurity program based essentially how much money do you have now? What is the essential, you know, what is your company doing regarding increasing budgets, decreasing budgets, or whatever? Do you have any emergencies you need to account for, or whatever else? But basically, your budget for next year is based on the budget this year. How was the budget this year based on? Your budget this year was based on the budget last year, and then a little bit of tweaking here and there based on conditions at the time. But then how was that budget based? So the budget two years ago, or whatever, was based on the budget that they had the year before with a little bit of tweaking. And this keeps going back and back and back, and most organizations that I see essentially have the same budget 
that they had more than a decade ago. And I ask a lot of CISOs, you know, am I wrong about this? And nobody has contradicted me to this point. And so when you start thinking about it, our budgets in cybersecurity really have nothing to do with where we are now regarding the technology, the threats, and everything else, because everything has changed in the last decade. So anyway, as I say, the biggest problem in cybersecurity, and this is like a fundamental issue, and this is why I titled the slide this way, is the problem for me is that CISOs are getting the budgets they deserve, not the budgets that they need. And they need to start to learn to deserve the budgets that they need. Because right now, the budgets they deserve are the budgets they make the best argument for. It doesn't matter what they need. If they can't make a good business case, they don't deserve the budget that they need. They're going to get the budget that essentially was based on a horse's behind. So anyway, keeping that along and moving on, so how should it be based? How should CISOs try to get the best budgets that they can? So anyway, I've already mentioned this, but you know, it doesn't make any sense at all, obviously. And here's the other thing. So I'd like to look, when I start looking at cybersecurity and how should cybersecurity programs be based, I start looking at how are other programs based? How do other departments get their budgets or whatever the case may be? So for example, in operations, if a COO ever wants to go ahead and say, hey, I want to improve a factory or I want to retool a factory to make something different, the COO sits there and they work with accountants and the accountants say, okay, if I have to take down the factory, taking down the factory is going to cost me X amount of money, whatever currency you want to call it. And then I got to think about, okay, I have to retool the factory. I have to buy new equipment. I have to train people. I'm going to lose income. Okay, that is the cost of doing it. Now, what's the benefit? Then they sit there and they calculate, okay, if I retool this factory to make widget X instead of widget Y, they start to say, okay, if I take widget X, I'm going to have a higher profit on widget X than I would on widget Y, and then it's going to take me X amount of time to recover the money, so by year seven, I'm going to have a ret like 75% return on investment by doing this, and they make a cost-benefit argument to the CEO, the board, or whoever else. So that's number one. Then you have accounting. When an accountant, when a CFO ever has to walk in and say, I want a new financial system, the CFO goes ahead and makes the argument to management saying, look, I know a new accounting system is going to cost me this amount of money. I'm going to have to retrain staff. I'm going to have to develop new interfaces. It costs me all of this. But this new accounting system will allow us to go into new areas of business. It will allow me to go ahead and operate more efficiently throughout the entire organization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in cybersecurity, I really like to highlight safety science because in cybersecurity, we think we are this precious little, sorry, this is a bad example. I use the word snowflake usually, and in Saudi Arabia, snowflake's not a good example. But we like to think we're this little precious one-of-a-kind thing, and nobody else ever has to deal with something like human error. And that's not the case. In safety science, for example, the whole safety science principle, whether it's, you know, safety people functioning in oil wells, functioning in a factory, functioning on street workers, or whatever the case is, they sit there and they study how much does an injury cost, how much does a death cost, and then they figure out what's the countermeasure, how do I counter people getting injured inside my facilities, and they go ahead and they figure out, well, an injury will cost me this amount of money, and it's going to cost me that amount of money to mitigate it. So I'm going to go ahead and make the argument to get money to figure out what's the optimal way to mitigate industry or injuries. And they get their money because they show a re real return on investment. Cybersecurity people do not know how to show a return on investment. And therefore, when they go for budgets, they're like, okay, you have this money, great. You'll have this money now. You'll have a little bit more money next year if you're lucky. So we got to start making better business arguments. What is the cost benefit to saying, if you give me X, I will return Y? That is not the argument that most CISOs are making walking into the organizations. So in order to do this, really what a CISO is, is a risk manager. You know, I usually stop, ask the audience, who here is a security professional? They raise their hand. I tell them they're all failures because the dif dictionary definition of security is being free from risk. 
The reality is you're never free from risk. We have to, as a security professional, we have to essentially manage our risk. We have to say, look, in order to do business, we have to put our organizations at risk. We cannot collect data without the risk that that data will be compromised. We cannot computerize something without the risk the computer will go down. But as a cybersecurity professional, we have to say, okay, what is the best method for managing that risk? And in order to manage the risk, you have to go ahead and you have to figure out, okay, what is the definition of risk? So risk at a high level is what is the value? In other words, what is your organization, your information worth? And then how, what's the exposure to the value? The exposure to the value is the threat. In other words, the who or what that's out to get you. And then the vulnerability. The vulnerability is what are the weaknesses that allows the threat to exploit you? And you know, generally, if you have no threat, you really have no risk. If you have no vulnerability, you have no risk. The reality is that's a fantasy world, and you have threats and you have vulnerabilities. So you do have exposure. That's the probability. And value times your exposure is what you theoretically have to lose. Your cybersecurity program is the implementation of countermeasures to mitigate your risk. And those countermeasures can go ahead and either mitigate the threat or the vulnerability. And therefore, you can go ahead and start to get a return on investment. So the question is, what's the return on investment on the implementation of countermeasures to mitigate threats or vulnerabilities? So in the general world, this is like probably the most important pre slide, uh, slide in the presentation. But generally, what's a cybersecurity program supposed to do? If you look at the red line, and does that work? Not well. So anyway, if you look at these lines, the black line represents your cybersecurity program. What are the countermeasures you put in place? The red line represents your vulnerabilities. And as you start to implement countermeasures, your vulnerability should decrease. Everything below the red line represents your potential loss. And everybody says, OK, great. So I want my cybersecurity program here where my vulnerabilities and potential loss are minimum. I'm like, no, because then the cost of your cyber program is much more than you're going to lose. And your cyber program is essentially your potential loss. So like, OK, maybe this where you cross. I'm like, no, not really there. What you want to do is you want to figure out what I call the risk optimization point. And that point is, what is an acceptable level of risk? And then what is the cost of the countermeasures that get you there? Now, there's a variety of different studies. And people say, well, this should never be more than 37% of the total loss. But again, in principle, what you want to do is figure out what is the potential loss you can live with and what are the vulnerab what's the cost of countermeasures to get you there? So that's the program at a high level. So how do we currently do this? The way we currently do this is you're given an arbitrary budget that's based on a horse's behind, like I mentioned before, from decades ago. And then you, put, you use the arbitrary budget to implement whatever countermeasures you can. And whatever countermeasures you can result in an arbitrary risk reduction. You know, I put it here about the same place. The reality is when I look at it over time, most of the time it's going to be closer to here. Because again, this is an arbitrary budget that gives you arbitrary risk reduction. And that's not what you want. In the ideal world, according to Ira, what you should have is a conscious acceptance of what is the risk you're willing to live with, then a conscious determination on what is the cost of the countermeasures to get you there, and then that's what your optimized budget should be. That's not the way we're doing it, and that's why we have a problem. So anyway, in the ideal world, what you should do is you should figure out what are the, vulner what are the countermeasures that give you the highest return on investment and implement that, then give you what's the next highest return on investment, and so on and so on and so on. Then when you start to implement and look at it, you're going to find that your, cyber, your risk reduction will be significantly more because you made a conscious decision on what's the highest return on investment. And even if the cost of your cybersecurity program is a little bit higher, that's OK. Because you're getting a really good reduction of risk. And you could start presenting that to management. Because CISOs are generally you know, like not the best people to justify their existence. When a CISO can start saying, what is the risk reduction, then they're going to have a value to the organization.
So in general, you know, start figuring this out. To do the math, and I only have a little bit of time to cover this, I can give you a more detailed set of slides if you want, if you reach out to me. But in the meantime, determining potential loss, you know, you have hard losses, like if you have a data breach, what is the cost, for example, of money that might have been lost? If you might have the cost of, for example, what is the recovery cost and things like that? Soft losses or what are the losses in trust? What is the outages? How much does that cost you? You know, then you might have in different regions of the world, if you're operating internationally, you might have fines. Those fines are going to be determined by the localities and things like that. Then I mentioned you have, you know, variable factors, for example, geography, regulatory environments that you're dealing with that can impact your potential loss. You know, which industry you're in, certain industries at different points in time are, you know, targeted by different groups of people, and that's a possible concern. Um, anyway, how do you obtain value? How can you go ahead and at least start to play the game I'm trying to convince you to play? You can start first off by going to your CFO. Your CFO might have done some study in the past of what is my cyber risk quantification, and that's a potential way to do it. You can look at industry incidents, so if you have some, an organization in your industry that lost money because of some cyber incident, then you could go ahead and figure out, okay, that might be my starting point. You might be able to pull data from insurance companies, which is something we do, and frankly, that helps you say, well, my organization is likely to be at risk at this level and so on. Then there are cyber risk quantification tools and things like that. The probability at a high level is the threat times the vulnerability. Your threat times the vulnerability, you have to look at what's the skill level of given threats. You have to look at what threats might target you. We were talking to um, somebody, for example, at a crypto organization. Crypto organizations are highly targeted by North Korea because North Korea loves to steal money. That's how they're funding their economy. On the other hand, they're not going to be targeted, for example, by China because China is not interested in really compromising a crypto company. So you have to figure out theoretically who are the types of threat actors that are trying to get you. That's where threat intelligence comes into play. Then when you could start putting this together and when you could start adding mathematical principles because, you know, I mentioned there's going to be, and I don't have time to cover the math, I have two minutes and 40 seconds left, but in general, there are concepts like flow theory. Math machine learning is really just a form of advanced mathematics. And I'm really recommending you start looking into it to determine, looking at how you can make better decisions. So in a case like this, this is determined from graph theory, where you could say, where are my threats? And what is the assets at risk? And then you could go ahead and map out your vulnerabilities to figure out how would a given threat get to your vulnerabilities. And then with the right mathematics again, again, that's a separate presentation, you could start to figure out what's the probability that any given, any given vulnerability will be exploited. And then when you combine, for example, I have this one is a misconfigured database, misconfigured database at 72% probability of being exploited. And then you figure out, for example, that could get to two types of assets. And let's just say the assets have a total value of $100 million. If you take $100 million, multiply it by 72%, a likelihood of pro probability of being exploited, then you get a $72 million vulnerability. And then that way you could say, okay, my risk is $72 million. Now what is the cost of the countermeasure to mitigate that $72 million loss? And then you can make a legitimate return on investment argument when you're arguing for your budget whenever the case comes up to do so on how to budget in the future. And you could start to figure out, again, which are the highest return on investment. So anyway, this was just one little mathematical formula. I talked through it already. But again, is it worth mitigating a vulnerability? Is the cost of mitigation justify the cost of the counter or the cost of well, the money you save, does, is that justified by the cost of the countermeasure? And then you could start prioritizing your cybersecurity program. Also look for choke points. And what I mean by choke points is when you can start to look at attack path visualization, if you see, for example, like this is a supply chain, and you see it's really like a linear set of vulnerabilities that can lead to it, you could start to figure out, I only need to mitigate one vulnerability to kill the entire attack chain. And that's a really good way to save money 
Because then you say, I only have to mitigate one vulnerability. And the thing is, yes, allow vulnerabilities to exist if they're mitigated. Because too many people are concerned about high-risk vulnerabilities, like high-risk CVSS and things like that, without is the vulnerability actually relevant to your organization. So anyway, with that in mind, um, I'm out of time. But anyway, to put it together, deserve what you need. And again, the way you deserve what you need is if you give me a budget of X, which is what I'm asking for, I will return Y. And I will keep you out of the news if that's what people care about. Like in the United States, the SEC is filing criminal charges against people now, and that's a concern. You know, not the same here, but still something if you work internationally to consider. But anyway, start looking at it, make, make arguments in monetary figures, and that's the best way. Deserve what you need. Again, walk into there. I pretty much beat that to death. Get buy my books. My books are awesome. I'm biased, but hey, that's my books. Anyway, they gave it out last year, not this year. Anyway, um, thank you for your time, and if you want the slide deck or want more information, let me know, but have a lovely day. Thanks.